My main and real pleasure is to welcome uh, Dr. Marie uh, Taganagi, who is um, Head of Preservation and Access in the Parliamentary Archives. The Parliamentary Archives are one of the real jewels of the Houses of Parliament. That, that is where you find all the interesting things that have been going on in this place for hundreds of years. And it really is a treasure trove of information, some of which we're going to have uh, later on. Uh, Murray read Modern History at St John's College, Oxford. Um, I was at Trinity College, Oxford, and I happen to know that all the really clever people were at St John's. So we can be <laughs> rest assured this is going to be a brilliant lecture uh, and has an MA in Archives and Records Management. Her PhD thesis, completed in 2012, was entitled Parliament and Women, 1900 to 1945, and looked at the different ways in which women interacted with Parliament during a period of seismic change as women became voters and members of Parliament for the first time, as well as looking at areas such as legislation affecting women's lives and gender equality after the First World War, and the role of women in standing committees and select committees uh, in the interwar period, her research uncovered much information about the little known and often completely unknown uh, presence and roles of women staff in Parliament. And this evening she's going to give us an insight into this research and how women were given unexpected opportunities to work in Parliament during the two world wars. So if you'll give Mari a very warm welcome this evening. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here this evening. Thank you to the Speaker's Advisory Committee on Works of Art for running this series of talks, uh, to Melanie for inviting me to do this one, and to the Parliamentary Archives for supporting me all through my research over seven years of a part-time PhD while working full-time. Okay. So today I'm talking about women's staff in Parliament during the First and Second World Wars. When considering the role of Parliament during the two world wars, it's perhaps more obvious to think about the big political picture, the legislation passed, the debates and discussion in the chambers, issues of defence, conscription and so on. But Parliament was also a home front. That is to say, it was part of the civilian population of a nation at war. Um, hundreds of men and women other than MPs and members of the House of Lords worked in the Palace of Westminster throughout both world wars, keeping the work of both houses running, including cleaners, cooks, doorkeepers, messengers, estate staff, police officers, telephone operators, clerks, Hansard reporters, administrative and secretarial staff. Indeed, some people even lived here, which is a surprising thought to those of us who work in the building today. But 65 women were resident here on census night in 1911, most of whom would have been here through the war as well. These included cleaning and kitchen staff in both houses, plus wives, daughters and servants in the great households based here, including the Speaker, Sergeant at Arms and others. And although few women overall worked for Parliament before the First World War, the war did lead to some new opportunities which I'm going to tell you about today. Um, I'm going to concentrate on six stories, three from the First World War and three from the Second World War. I won't spend equal amounts of time on all of them, um, in, in case you wonder. Um, some of them I'm going to concentrate on more than others, because there's more to say. Together, I think these stories contribute to the story of Parliament as a home front. And if there's a theme running through it, it's probably parliamentary families, because I found, certainly with regard to the First World War, whole families uh, work for Parliament and were involved in the war effort here. Um, also, overall, they illustrate situations found outside Parliament in workplaces everywhere, such as the substitution of male labour with female labour, participation in defence of the realm, women taking on new roles beyond that previously defined as women's work, uh, often not paid the same rate as men for the same work, and generally, although not always, dismissed at the end of the war. Um, I'm going to start with the girl porters who were employed by the Sergeant at Arms Department in the House of Commons during the First World War. Um, I should say straight off that th this is not a picture of them, unfortunately. I don't have a picture of them. But this is to show you what they would have looked like. They're wearing the same uniform as uh, the girl porters here would have worn, um, which is the, um, the War Office girl messenger uniform. The Sergeant at Arms, who is the officer in the House of Commons responsible for ceremony and security, uh, was also in this period responsible for some facilities functions, including cleaning. He employed both male and female cleaning staff before the war. Um, four other women were employed by his department during the war, and these were temporary girl porters or girl messengers who were employed to deliver mail and other items between offices in Parliament during labour shortages during the First World War. And in an age before modern telecommunications, of course, delivery of letters and other items was a large and important task requiring a lot of staff. Um, it's a very good example here of uh, female labour substituting for men. Uh, the names of the four girl porters in this building were Elsie and Mabel Clark, who were aged 16 and 14, 
Dorothy Hart, who was aged 18, and Vera Goldsmith, aged 16. And you can see from those ages, they really were girls. The girl is not used here as a pejorative term to describe working women, but, um, uh, but because as, as a, in a descriptive way, the youngest being only 14 years old. Their job titles in Parliament were girl porters because they were replacing male porters, but they were also known as messengers because they wore the same uniform of uh, brown drill overalls and hats worn by the War Office girl messengers. And two of them, Dorothy Hart and Vera Goldsmith, did previously work as War Office War Office Girl Messengers. They were employed in Parliament from April 1917 and discharged in March 1919 on the return of demobilised staff, except for Mabel Clark, who sadly died of influenza in November 1918. The Assistant Sergeant at Arms, Walter H. Erskine, held off employing women until the staff of male porters had been reduced to two. He was clearly very worried about um, employing women to do such work. He felt it necessary to write to the Speaker uh, to warn it is an innovation, and also wrote to heads of offices in the, in the House of Commons requesting that their own office messengers do a greater share in carrying heavy boxes and books. But by the end of their employment, his fears had been completely allayed. He wrote to the War Office to ask if they could if, um, arrange for their transfer to some other government department um, because they wanted to continue in similar employment. He said, It is impossible for me to speak too highly of the way these three girls have done their work while at the House of Commons. Now, I was very curious as to who these girls were and how they came to work in Parliament. And uh, one tiny sentence caught my eye. The document on the right, which is from the file about the girl porters in the parliamentary archives, um, if you can see it, says uh, Miss Elsie um, Clark, Miss Mabel Clark, and at the bottom it says in quite faint letters, nieces of Porter Clark. And uh, so this caught my attention. I thought they were related to an existing member of staff. And it took me a while to find out, because Clark is uh, probably second only after Smith as a common name uh, to trace. But I did eventually find them in family history records. Um, and uh, what really cracked it was when I found the census form, um, uh, which you can see below there. Um, which, uh, as you can see from that, uh, the head of the household is John Clark, the top line there. Uh, he's a police constable. His wife follows, Olive, and then there are two um, sons, Ernest and Alfred, and then you have Elsie, who's one of the girl messengers. Um, uh, and at the bottom there, this is the clinching thing, Samuel Clark, brother of John Clark, uh, who's described uh, at the bottom there as cleaner House of Commons. So once I knew that, I knew I had the right family. John and Olive, in fact, had eventually seven children. Ernest, Alfred and Elsie listed here, Mabel, the second girl messenger, and then Harold, Hilda and Jack, all born between 1896 and 1911. Um, John joined the Metropolitan Police in 1890, married Olive in 1894. His brother Samuel, mentioned there, started working for the Sergeant at Arms Department here as a cleaner in 1898, when he would have been aged just 19 years old. He was promoted to Porter in 1912, hence the nieces of Porter Clark by 1917. He married and had a daughter in 1908. Um, now, John being a police constable, I did wonder if he might have also worked in Parliament. I couldn't find this out, and I suspect uh, one will never know one way or the other. Um, but, of course, police would have worked here. Um, and I did find out the Clark family lived very close to Parliament. Um, if you can see, uh, the policeman there is on the terrace of the House of Commons looking out over the Thames, and he's looking out at that area which is pictured in that map. Um, oh, sorry, back uh, that map of Lambeth, for an, uh, uh, which is dated a little bit later, but shows the, the streets in question. Um, you probably can't see very uh, well on the screen there, but um, you have St Thomas's, uh, St Thomas Hospital running up to Westminster Bridge, and one of the roads to the, immediately to the right of that is called Paris Street. That is where Samuel Clark lived after he got married with his wife and child. And above that, a couple of streets above that, you have Boniface Street. Uh, and that is where the Clark family lived, uh, where Elsie and Mabel were born um, uh, in the early 1900s. Um, this area is described um, by Charles Booth in his Life and Labour of People in London in the 1890s as largely tenanted by police, so it's not too surprising they lived there. Um, by 1911, the family were living in Kennington in Hurley Road, another favourite habitation of police. Um, they had moved to Walworth, though, by the time the First World War began in a road described as inhabited by mechanics, labourers, printers and clerks. Um, anyway, so the Clark family all lived extremely close to Parliament. By the time of the war, though, a number of things had affected them. Um, and I'm just going to refer to the family tree here, which hopefully make it simpler. In the middle there, you can see John Clark and Samuel Clark, the two brothers that I've been talking about, and John, who married Olive, and all their children. Samuel married a, a woman called Mary Ann, and they had one daughter, Vera. Um, sadly, uh, Mary Ann died in 1913, leaving Samuel a widower with a small, ch a small daughter. John uh, resigned from the police um, in 1914 on grounds of ill health, and he died soon afterwards, leaving Olive a widow. 
Alfred and Ernest, the two older brothers of uh, Elsie and Mabel there, joined the army in 1915. Um, and um, Ernest was discharged sick in uh, 1916, which probably saved his life because he was in the same regiment as his brother, um, uh, Alfred, who then died at the Somme a month later. So by the time we get to 1917, um, Elsie and Mabel's mother, Olive, is a widow who'd lost one adult son to the war and the other who had been discharged sick from it. She had five children aged 16 and under to look after and possibly also her motherless niece, Vera. Small wonder that Elsie and Mabel had to really had to go out to work uh, at a young age and working in Parliament was not a first job for either of them either. Um, Samuel um, was uh, called up, no, he, was, he volunteered for war service in 1915 and was called up in June 1916, but was sent home because he was a widow with, with one child um, and he continued to work for the sergeant through the rest of the war. Um, so hopefully Elsie and Mabel's employment helped the family, but um, it is sad, very sad that uh, Mabel died uh, in November 1918 of influenza and double pneumonia. Uh, she would have been aged just 15 years old at that point. And as to what happened to them afterwards, um, I haven't been able to trace, as I say, Elsie, um, Mabel died, I haven't been able to trace what happened to Elsie, but uh, her uncle Samuel um, continued to work for the Sergeant at Arms Department until he retired aged 60 in 1939. By this time he had been promoted to assist Assistant Superintendent in the Members' Waiting Room. Um, Olive, the mother, also lived a very long life and died in exactly the same house in uh, Woolworth um, in the 1940s that she'd been living in in the, uh, 1911, so I kind of hope the rest of the family also made good as well. Um, so the Clark girls were two of the girl porters. Who were the other two? Um, these, are, these sheets are, again, from the girl messengers file in the parliamentary archives, and these were written by the War Office and passed on to the sergeant when he employed them, uh, along with all the references that the War Office had taken up about them. Um, uh, you may be able to see the left-hand notice about Dorothy Hart, the right one, Vera Goldsmith, their names are at the top. Dorothy was born in May 1898 in Clapham. Her father was a journeyman, plumber and lead worker. When the war started, he went to work for a munitions work in Wareham. That is mentioned um, a few lines down from the top there. She left school at 14 and went to work in a dressmaker's, which was badly hit by the war. She then worked as a girl messenger at the war office from October 1916. And you will see, I don't know if you can see, um, the war office messenger superintendent recorded she was nice looking. Um, so <laughs> After leaving the House of Commons in 1919, Dorothy again um, pursued dressmaking work. She got married um, to William Haddock, an engineer from Birmingham, in 1925. They had three children. She died in 1980, having reached the ripe old age of 82. Vera Goldsmith, the fourth girl porter on the right-hand side there, was born in October 1900. Her father is a gas fitter, also mentioned on the sheet there, from Croydon, and her mother was a former domestic servant. She had an older brother, Algernon, who served as a corporal in the Essex Regiment during the war. Uh, he survived it and lived through. Um, she also worked as a dressmaker after school and then became a girl messenger at the War Office from December 1916. And then along with Dorothy, she was then one of several girls recommended to work in the House of Commons. Um, after 1919, Vera um, pursued office work. Erskine wrote a reference to the Food Control Office in Croydon in, in August 1919 for her, saying she was quick, intelligent and gave complete satisfaction. In 1920, Vera wrote to Erskine to ask for another reference because she wanted to become a member of the London Chamber of Commerce. Now, the London Chamber of Commerce had been established in um, uh, 1881 to represent the interests of the London trading communities, uh, community and assist its members in resolving day-to-day -day trading problems. There is unfortunately no evidence to show Vera succeeded in becoming a member. I've combed the records at London Metropolitan Archives uh, to, with no result. Nevertheless, um, I like to think that her interest in it shows that she wanted to pursue a professional career in business um, and not simply an administrative role. She died in uh, October 1950 in Croydon, aged 49. She never married. So that is the girl porters in the First World War. Just as a postscript, you might like to know that there were also four women porters employed by the sergeant during the Second World War, without the same degree of angst about carrying loads and uniforms this time. And again, two of them were sisters, um, Miss Joyce Clark and Miss Janet Edwell, uh, aged 25 and 30 respectively, were employed as women porters from November 1941. They were the daughters of William Munsey, previously an office keeper in the Commons, who died earlier that year. And their mother, Clara Violet Munsey, was also employed by the sergeant as a cleaner from 1944. So this sort of family connection goes on in the sergeant's department through the Second World War. And as I say, that the two sisters, one of them was definitely a war widow. Um, her husband had died in service uh, in Egypt in 1941. Um, 
and a third of those four Second World War women porters was a direct replacement for her husband. Mrs Grace Phyllis Culber uh, uh, replaced her husband, Sir Vice St Joseph Culber, a porter who left the sergeant's department when he was called up by the RAF in 1942. He survived the war and came back in 1946, and she was discharged redundant. Uh, there was never any um, <coughs> hope, um, fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, for... Um, uh, uh, for the women uh, to work on. Maybe in some cases they, they wouldn't have wanted to, but uh, maybe in some cases they would. Uh, there was never any prospect, though, of any of these girl porters keeping their job after the war. Uh, so I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to talk about something a bit different. Um, I'm going to talk about how the war affected May Jewel Rogers. Uh, and I could tell you an awful lot about her and her life and career, but I'm just going to restrict it to the First World War period here. Um, May Ashworth uh, founded Ashworth & Co typewriting office at the age of 25 in 1888. Um, itself a remarkable thing to do, I think, for a, a woman of that age. In 1895, Ashworths were employed um, by the Sergeant at Arms to provide typing services for the House of Commons. Miss Ashworth maintained a typewriting room within Parliament in the House of Lords on the first floor west front um, and a staff of typists who were qualified to write shorthand. Initially, the typists were there for the members to use, but they soon came to do work in both, for both houses as well. Uh, May got married um, to William Paul Jewell Rogers in 1900. Uh, he was 24 years old and she was 37, um, although her age was given on her marriage certificate as 34. Um, I think of her as the ever youthful Miss Ashworth, because uh, by the 1911 census, she's actually 48, which is down to 41. Anyway... Um, <laughs> So after she got married, she and her husband ran Ashworth & Co's partners together until the war came along. In August 1916, William applied to join the army. I suspect he applied just before he would have been conscripted anyway. He was appointed to a commission in the Royal Garrison Artillery and was stationed at Manchester from uh, November 1916. Um, now, he didn't have a great time there, I suspect, because uh, medical boards in 1918 and 1919 um, found a heart murmur. He'd been complaining about ill health, but uh, it wasn't bad enough to stop them returning him to duty. The doctor's comments include, um, this is his military file at the National Archives, he has taken little exercise and thinks he gets swelling in calves of the legs, probably obsessional. He is too stout and out of condition. Exercise and a dry diet would prove very beneficial. Uh, this isn't the sort of average picture of... Uh, First World War soldiers at the front, I think, but then he was, he was based in Manchester. Um, William wrote plaintively to the sergeant twice in early 1919, asking if the sergeant could help expedite his demobilisation, describing himself as a pivotal man to the House of Commons. The sergeant wrote once without success, and the second time replied to say he couldn't do any more because he cannot describe you as an official of the House. So there. Um, William was finally demobilised from the Special Reserve in June 1919. Following this, William and May's business partnership in Ashworth & Co was dissolved by mutual consent in August 1919. May took responsible for all debts paid and owing and continued to run the company as before. He became a motor car agent. May then initiated divorce proceedings in October 1919, claiming conjugal relations had been withheld since mid-November 1914, um, i.e. throughout the whole war, um, saying she hoped things would be better with his demobilisation, demobilisation but they weren't. Um, the divorce was granted in November 1920 on grounds of adultery coupled with desertion by reason of non-compliance with a decree for restitution of conjugal rights. Um, William remarried soon after he married the respondent, uh, the female respondent cited in the divorce petition. Um, I suspect they both wanted a divorce. Uh, they each had to write these letters for the sake of the divorce court to, to show their marriage had broken down and the conjugal rights could not be resumed. Um, I suspect they both wanted this situation. Um, May was clearly an exceptional woman. Ashworth & Co was very much her company before she got married. I don't think she just became a sleeping partner after the marriage. Um, who knows, she may have got divorced from him regardless. Nevertheless, the war played its part here in removing her husband from the sphere of um, operations. Uh, May continued to run Ashworth successfully in his absence during the war. This concluded negotiating an official contract between the sergeant and Ashworth and & Co for the first time during 1918-19. to And it seems to me that the war gave her her chance to get her business back. I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to talk about uh, the court family in the House of Lords, uh, my third and final story about First World War. Um, pictured here are uh, Robert Ambry Court and Hannah Frances Mary Court, who was known as May, clearly a more common name in those days. The, they were brother and sister twins who, successfully who successively worked for the House of Lords, Robert between 1903 and 1917, May between 1918 and 1943. Their story shows the powerful impact the First World War had on a parliamentary family and the opportunity it provided for a woman. 
Their father, Thomas Ambry Court, started working for the House of Lords in 1873. He rose through the ranks and in 1903 he became Receiver of Fees, Accountant and Examiner of Acts and Head of the Accounting and Copying Department in the House of Lords. He and his wife Hannah had four children. Two of them, Cecil, the oldest, and Edward, the youngest, emigrated to Canada in the early 20th century. The twins here, Robert and May, were born on 13th of December 1880 in Balham. Their mother died in 1895. Now, at age 18, uh, Robert came to work with his father in the House of Lords um, as a copyist in 1899, um, while May worked initially as a junior teacher. Um, Robert got married, had a son, born in 1910, continued to work um, in the um, Houses of Parliament. Uh, you can see on his is a 1911 census returns where he's recorded as Clerk Accountants Department, House of Lords. And by this point, May had become an embroideress in decorative society needlework. Um, uh, both that and teaching, of course, were among very few occupations open to middle class women in this period. And thus far, uh, both May and Robert are following their typical gender roles. But then the war came. When war broke out um, in 1914, Robert was quick to volunteer to serve, uh, the complete opposite, in fact, of Mr. Jewel Rogers, I think. Um, he had four years' territorial army service behind him already and applied for a commission in the army. The commanding officer nominating him was convinced he would make a good officer and asked for Robert to be posted to his own regiment in Yorkshire as a lieutenant, as indeed happened. <coughs> Uh, Robert was appointed captain in September 1915 and later a temporary major commanding a battalion of the West Riding Regiment. Um, as you can see from, uh, from this page here, you probably can't read it very well, but this is a page, um, a draft page from the House of Lords Offices um, report in uh, 1916. Um, it lists all the clerks um, in the House of Lords who were away on um, war duty. And they're all listed there. You see at the top it says, uh, of the clerks, and then it lists one, two, three, six names. Then there's one person from the library. And then at the bottom there it says, accountant's department, Mr. Court, Junior. Um, and then it says Major, West Riding Regiment, um, Suvla Bay, which is Gallipoli and uh, Egypt. So that's where he served. Um, it, it goes on to um, explain that uh, all House of Lords clerks of military age without any medical disqualification were serving in the war. Um, and at the very bottom, it recalls that of the messenger staff, um, all of them were over age and mostly old soldiers, but five had rejoined anyway. Uh, and this is presumably why there were no girl porters in the Lords, that uh, the men were all over age, military age anyway. Um, so Robert went off to war and uh, survived clearly an awful lot, um, but he was killed in action on the 26th of April 1917 at Hermes Pas de Calais in France. He was 36 years old. The effects listed at his death consisted of a revolver, vacuum flask, gloves, cigarette case, wristwatch, writing pad, handkerchief and a hold all with a shaving brush. His name is inscribed on Parliament's war memorials um, in the Royal Gallery in the House of Lords and on the Recording Angel Memorial in Westminster Hall, which is pictured there. You can see he was one of two of the two clerks um, in the House of Lords to die during the war. The House of Lords paid a gratuity of £470 to his widow. Um, this might not sound a lot, but it was more than she got from the army and the whole value of his estate put together. Um, one can only speculate on how desolate um, Robert's death must have left his widow, his seven-year-old son, his twin sister, and his 67-year-old father, Thomas. Thomas had already lost one son to the war. The youngest son there, Edward uh, Crawford Court, served with the 1st Canadian Mounted Rifles Battalion, Saskatchewan Regiment, with the rank of sergeant, and he died at the Somme on 1st of April 1916, aged 28. He's buried at Regina Trench. Thomas must have hoped that Robert would make it through the war, return to work in the House of Lords and succeed him as House of Lords accountant. Um, this didn't happen, but perhaps the opportunity Robert's death gave to his twin sister might have been some consolation because just under a year later, May followed in his footsteps by entering the House of Lords accounting department. It would be too simple to say she was given her brother's job, but his death had provided a vacancy and therefore an employment opportunity. Thomas Ambry Court did not live to see his son become accountant, but he did live to see his daughter become so. Maycourt was initially appointed as one of two lady clerical assistants by the House of Lords in April 1918, along with Miss Mabel Waterman, uh, appointed during shortages of male labour and near the end of the war. But unlike many such women elsewhere, both Court and Waterman kept their jobs after the war and were quickly promoted. Because on the 1st of June 1919, Miss Court was appointed accountant, placed on the same salary scale as H.P. Norris, who was the head of department at the time, a remarkable example of equal pay in this period. Uh, Miss Waterman was promoted at the same time. There's no doubt that Miss Court's uh, role was an executive and responsible and managerial role. Um, an unusual account, being accountant was an unusual role for a woman to hold in this period. And when H.P. Norris retired in 1926, uh, uh, May Court became head of department the following year with the title Receiver of Fees and Accountant. This appointment was reported in the press as follows. The monstrous regiment. 
the few diehard anti-feminists who are left may fly to John Knox for consolation in the latest shock they have received, for the monstrous regiment of women has captured one of the high administrative posts in the House of Lords staff. Miss HFM Court has been made head of the Costings and Accounts Department. Her assistants will be two women. They will be three lonely women, because in no other department or office in the House of Lords do women hold the higher appointments. Their duties, however, are intricate enough to keep them from brooding over their solitary grandeur. Anyway, so there you go. So it, it was a significant appointment. Um, in the nine years between Norris's retirement and uh, uh, Miss Waterman's resignation on marriage in 1936, no men worked in this department. A male assistant accountant was appointed in 1936. Um, that was Percy Johnson, who eventually became accountant, and he reported to Miss Court. Uh, Miss Co uh, May Court was awarded the OBE in 1942 for her services to the House of Lords and retired in 1944, having worked in the House of Lords for 26 years. Although her retirement saw the end of female management of this department, all the women appointed under her management retained their positions and went on to have careers with the House of Lords after the war. Like other early women workers in Parliament and elsewhere, Maycourt owed her opportunity to family collection and wartime experiences. Her subsequent success, however, was undoubtedly due to her own abilities. And she worked right through to the Second World War, which brings us nicely on to the Second World War. Something a little bit different here. Did you know there was a munitions unit right in the heart of the Palace of Westminster during the Second World War? It seems remarkable today, but it was right in the heart of the House of, uh, in the House of Parliament, underneath Central Lobby, which is uh, right in the slap bang in the middle of Parliament. The Second World War um, affected the Palace of Westminster in various ways. Uh, the Palace suffered 12 direct hits uh, during the bombing, plus damage caused by six explosions nearby. There were th three people were killed, 15 injured. There were 1,224 air raid alerts, totaling 2,198 hours. And overall, it is estimated that 1,168 people took part in the internal defence of Parliament during the Second World War, of whom uh, nearly 800 um, helped for more than six months. These included fire guards, home guards, custodians, police, ARP firemen, Red Cross workers and others. Women took part in a number of these activities, which I'm going to talk about now, including fire watching, the home guards, which you can see pictured here, and the munitions unit. So, uh, first of all, fire watching. Following the Blitz in uh, autumn 1940, fire watching became compulsory through the country, although it took a while to get off the ground in Parliament. A fire committee was set up in 1941, and um, uh, in addition to firemen for the National Fire Service, there were 100 and 140 civilian conscripts and 100 plus 160 home guard on fire watching duty by October that year, uh, supplemented by a dedicated body of 30 full-time paid ARP firemen from July 1942. A number of female staff participated in the fire watching, and Red Cross <coughs> nurses, like the one pictured here, uh, were stationed throughout the palace. Uh, you can see um, the fire watchers and the Red Cross nurse um, standing right underneath the statue of Barry there, who I hope would have approved their efforts to maintain his palace. Um, the Home Guard, um, there were six women in the Palace of Westminster Home Guard. Um, the Home Guard, or Local Defence Volunteers, was founded in 1940. A force of over 100 volunteers was quickly recruited to the Palace of Westminster Company, mostly men with previous war experience. They took part in the fire-watching duties and also sentry duties on the terrace, uh, in addition to manning a gun at the exit to Westminster Underground Station and uh, taking responsibility for anti-tank measures under West, um, over Westminster Bridge. There were six women auxiliaries in the Palace of Westminster Home Guard, and four of them are pictured here. The caption on the back of this photograph says, there are also a few women auxiliaries who work on communications and are expert shots. So there you go. Um, all four of these women, uh, we know who they are, um, were female secretaries, and they're also a good example of uh, wartime appointments, in fact, um, early in the Second World War. Uh, from left to right, we have uh, Miss Pamela Ward, who was appointed temporary typist to the clerk of the house in November 1940. Uh, she worked until resigning in 1946. Then Miss Pauline Bevington, uh, typist in the committee office from January 1940, appointed personal assistant in the library in 1946, resigned on marriage in 1949. Miss Barbara Shuttleworth, temporary typist in the committee office from April 1942, personal assistant in the library 1947 and sadly died the following year, July 48. Um, Pamela Matthew, typist in the committee office from 13th of January 1941, personal assistant 1946, worked on, went on for Parliament until the late 1950s. <laughs> Uh, so the pattern, which you can see uh, in the four women here, is taking on a lot of women early in wartime, of course, when the men would have been called up. And they kept on, they were kept on for the most part um, after the war until they got married, when they were expected to resign, as was very common at the time. 
Um, the other two, because as I say there were six women auxiliaries, the, the two who aren't pictured were Miss Vera Heslop and Miss Vera uh, Michelle. Um, and she worked in the munitions unit, which brings us to uh, the Palace of Westminster munitions unit. Um, in 1942, in response to offers of voluntary labour from members, officials and staff, um, munitions training work was organised um, for um, people in Parliament uh, during evenings at the London County Council Westminster Technical Institute. Nearly 70 people participated in this, including the four female secretaries that we just saw, and also Thelma Cazalet MP, who wrote afterwards, I must say, I thoroughly enjoyed doing the, munitions, doing the munitions. Uh, the London County Council decided after a couple of months that it needed the workshops itself, and so instead it was proposed to have a munitions workshop on site in the palace instead. Uh, space beneath central lobby was identified and after many, many months of problems, I don't know how they persevered through all the problems that they had, but they, they did. They finally started production in December 1943 under engineer Mr C. Donaldson and it ran until December 1945. It was staffed by more than 100 male and female volunteers recruited from members, officials and staff of both houses and their relatives and friends. A high proportion were women, a lot of them were wives of MPs and peers. They were very enthusiastic about the work, for the most part, very dedicated. The unit employed some paid staff too, including a woman, a woman skilled capstan operator, Mrs Hodges, a welfare officer, Mrs Michelle, who was uh, also in the Home Guard, um, a female chartered accountant, so we have another woman accountant by this point, uh, clerical and store staff, who you can see pictured, two of whom you can see pictured on the top right, and female catering staff led by the cook, Mrs Trollope, which served 150 meals a day um, to the munitions unit staff. And volunteers. The bottom left photo show, shows a Mrs. Colbert serving Mrs. Hodges, the capstan operator, and Mr. Donaldson, who ran the unit. The main product of the factory was a torque amplifier, which was part of a predictor unit for mobile and stationary anti aircraft guns. Work was also undertaken in the assembly of detonator holders and priming fuses, but they weren't actually <laughs> manufacturing explosives here, which is probably a relief to everyone to know. The volunteers inspected, assembled, and dispatched all the parts to the filling factories. Over 2 million shell fuse parts were inspected for the Woolwich Arsenal Inspection Department, and 95,000 special, special packing case fittings were made as a sideline. All in all, I think it's quite remarkable. Uh, the bottom right picture is a farewell picture um, when the unit closed, and of course without any prospect of uh, continuing employment for any of the staff or volunteers, of course. Um, my next story is uh, the first female Hansard reporter, the first permanent female Hansard reporter, whose name is Mrs Winder. The Second World War brought opportunities for women to report on parliamentary proceedings for the first time. For example, um, Miss Ellen Bayliss from Reuters became the first woman to hold a personal permanent ticket to the press gallery in 1941. The Reuters chief of parliamentary news wrote to explain at the time, under the scattered conditions in which the gallery lives nowadays, I do not think this will cause anybody any inconvenience, although I've tried to avoid it for as long as possible. She is a very quiet and unassuming person, well used to men. She is married. The chairman of the gallery... <laughs> The chairman of the gallery replied, One of the chief beauties of the gallery hitherto has been its immunity from all things feminine. It is, tr it is true there have been women within its portals before, but there were birds of passage sent on transient missions by puckish editors. I look forward to the time when peace and reconstruction may restore us to our former tranquility. You can tell they were journalists. Um, anyway, so as well as the press gallery, um, Hansard report... Uh, Hansard reporters, who produced the official um, edited verbatim record of speeches and um, debates in Parliament, um, employed their first permanent woman reporter um, in 1944. Uh, women were employed on a temporary basis as early as 1919, but we have to wait till 44 for the first permanent one. Mrs Jean Winder was initially put on a one-year contract at a salary of £400. She was then made permanent on a salary of £560, below that of the men, despite the fact she was performing the same job and highly rated. You can see here a comment from the editor of the official report, Mr P.F. Cole, uh, on her employment. Um, he says that he only employed her because he really could not find uh, a man for the job. Hansard staff has lost four good men to the services. It was absolutely necessary to secure further assistance. Um, but after she'd worked there for a bit, um, he soon came to appreciate her and actually rated her very highly um, indeed. Um, you can see, uh, he says, I'm very anxious to retain her services. She has helped us at a time of great difficulty and shortage, has proved a capable and efficient reporter, has learned our ways and formulas. Amazing. Um, indeed, the commendations on her work from individual members of the House have exceeded those obtained for the work of any other member of the staff. She is most willing and active. We should all much regret her loss as a colleague. So, she was a roaring success. Who was she? Although everybody called her Jean, Jean Winder, her name was actually Florence. Uh, this is uh, given in the salary records at the Parliamentary Archives. She was born Florence Mary Hayward 
Oxford in uh, 1907 and married R Ralph Spearing Winder in 1940. Sadly, he went down on the HMS Vicenda in June 1941, leaving her a war widow. Um, although Cole asks her um, here for her to be paid the same rate as uh, for a man, this didn't happen. Uh, she continued to be paid less than the men, and this reached ahead in 1951 when she reached the top of her pay band and could no longer get any pay rises. Um, the Treasury refused to act, and her case was taken up by an MP, Irene Ward. Um, Irene Ward was a great champion of uh, uh, equal rights for women. Um, and uh, ironically, um, this whole story meant that uh, Miss, Mrs. Winder, the Hansard reporter, ironically featured in Hansard herself during a debate on equal pay in 1951. Uh, Ward declares, the House of Commons is run on the basis of equal pay, but there is one woman on the Hansard staff in the gallery, Miss Winder, who has not got equal pay. I've got Mrs. Winder's permission to draw the attention of the House to what I consider is an intolerable constitutional position, in which we have servants of the House who have no protection whatsoever refuse a salary which has been specifically recommended by Mr. Speaker. This was part of an enormous battle that Irene Ward fought with the Treasury on Mrs. Winder's behalf, um, a, a very large file preserved today at the National Archives. Um, everybody at the House of Commons, from the Speaker downwards, thought that she should get equal pay, but the Treasury were obdurate to the point where they didn't seem to be able to get back down. And the end result to the compromise that followed was, although she didn't exactly get equal pay, in 1953, the maximum uh, of her scale was raised to the same as the men, and therefore she could start rising up the pay band again. It was also agreed that as the, as the maximum of their band rose, hers would rise too. So it was, it was a victory. Equal pay was achieved in the civil service uh, two years later, in 1955, and implemented in stages, including here in Parliament. So hopefully she would have, only, she would have uh, got her equal pay anyway two years later. Um, the final story I'm going to look at tonight is uh, the first women clerks in the House of Commons, and particularly the story of Miss Kay Midwinter. Um, clerks in Parliament are the top run of the staffing ladder and not the bottom. Uh, three women were first appointed as clerks in the Commons on a temporary basis during the Second World War. These women are not well known. Um, the first woman clerk was Kay Midwinter, who was appointed temporary clerk in the committee office on the 29th of April 1940. As the press reported excitedly at the time, girl clerk in Commons. <laughs> Parliamentary history was made yesterday by a girl, Miss Kay, <laughs> Miss Kay Midwinter, dark, slim, businesslike, who served the League of Nations for nine years, has been appointed a temporary clerk in the House of Commons. Uh, it went on, the first woman clerk has all the privileges extended to her male colleagues. She can listen to the debates from behind the bar or from the official gallery. In fact, at times it will be her duty to do so. She is liable to be called on to act as a division clerk. The appointment is a wartime measure. It's also a complete break with precedent. In case you wonder um, how old the girl was, she was 32 years old at the time of her appointment. Um, you'll also notice it claims at the bottom there that she's the first woman other than a woman MP to set her feet on the floor of the chamber while the House is sitting. I don't think that's true. For a start, there was a suffragette who ran into the chamber in 1906, so I think she was the first, if anyone was. But anyway, it's the press. Um, Midwinter's presence certainly caused a ripple in the parliamentary establishment. One of her fellow clerks, Basil Drennan, wrote to his parents that it had created a sensation in the committee office. A woman amongst all these men, and for the first time in history, another sanctuary gone, I feel. Um, his father wrote back regretting the loss of sanctuary. <laughs> Midwinter worked on the Commons Select Committee on National Expenditure, set up to scrutinise government expenditure during the war. The committee was very large and operated through a number of subcommittees who investigated different subjects. Uh, Midwinter was initially the personal assistant to the committee clerk, Captain Diver. When it became clear she had the ability to clerk a subcommittee herself, she became <coughs> clerk to the subcommittee on transport in April 1941 and then clerk to the subcommittee on works A in 1942. She also clerked an informal subcommittee on women's medical services, uh, which produced two reports. Diver said their success was largely attributable to Ms. Midwinter's tactful handling, her continuous hard work, and her ability to take a good draft. Um, Late in life, uh, Kay Midwinter remembered her experience in the wartime Houses of Parliament uh, in an oral history recording. You can see here, she remembers standing behind the Speaker's chair while behind um, five or six yards from Churchill while he made all his famous war speeches. He used to glare at me, much to say, what's this woman doing? But never challenged me. I was expecting to be ordered to be removed from the chamber, but it was great fun. And when it came to laying the report on the table of the House, my male colleague said, oh, you better not do that, you know, it's never been done by a woman before. So I said, for that reason, I'm going to do it. So there we are. But really, one was up against male prejudice throughout. There was never any question of promotion. Never mind promotion, she wasn't even being paid anything like as much as her male colleagues were. In one of several attempts to get her salary raised, Diver argued that the work of each subcommittee was more than equivalent to that of an ordinary select committee. Her burdens had been considerably greater than and as efficiently car carried as those of other subcommittee clerks whose emoluments are more than twice what she is receiving. His case was supported by O.C. Williams Clerk Committees. And additionally, the two women MPs who were on this committee, these were Irene Ward, yes, her again, and Lady Davidson. 
They express their conviction that Miss Midwinter is inadequately paid and their intention of taking the matter up directly with Mr Speaker. So what was this salary and how did it compare with the men? Uh, this is a salary book in the parliamentary archives. Uh, you can see at the top uh, it says uh, Midwinter, Miss Kay, appointed temporary clerk. And uh, on the right there you've got the various um, her salary um, across time. At the top it says 260, that was her starting salary in Parliament. And then um, later on it does get rise, it, it does race um, through various lengths. And then if you can see the bit in bold, it says um, on the 1st of uh, September 1942, the range of 480 to 650 was authorised, being the women's equivalent of 600 to 800 pounds per annum. So after all that effort, her salary was that the maximum she could ever hope to earn was just £50 more than the minimum guaranteed to her male colleagues. Basil Drennan, in case you wonder, was earning £850 in this period. He was a much more experienced senior clerk, but doing exactly the same job as she was. Uh, Kay Midwinter left um, Parliament to work for the Foreign Office in 1943, and um, she went on to work uh, in the United Nations after the war, where she had a long career, first in New York and then in Geneva. She married late in life, and she died in Geneva in 1995. Uh, Midwinter was the first but not the only woman temporary clerk during the Second World War. There were two others. One was Miss DJ Davson. She had a very promising career and was thought very highly of by her managers, but her career was curtailed by the marriage bar. She, um, at, after the end of the war, she was put on the established staff in, on the 5th of July 1946, but removed when she got married on the 8th of October that year. She was retained in an unestablished capacity as a shorthand typist and thus ended the Commons wartime experiment with female clerks. As the marriage bar was abolished in the civil service on the 15th of October the same year, i.e. a week later, um, a decision that would have filtered down to Parliament in the end, Davison was unlucky to be caught by the bar. I mean, we don't know, she might have wanted to leave on marriage, but to continue, as she was kept on as a typist, I'm inclined to think she probably wanted to say, and they said no. Anyway, uh, the third and final um, wartime Commons clerk was an altogether different kind of woman. Her name was Monica Felton. Dr Monica Felton, because she is doctor despite the Mrs uh, title given there, was appointed temporary clerk in May 1942 on a salary of £600, um, better than midwinter. Uh, the reason for that being that Felton had a PhD and also previous government service. It was still, however, less than Felton had been earning in her previous role at the Ministry of Supply. Basil Drennan wrote to his parents um, on Felton's appointment that they had a new temporary colleague to act as a sort of economic advisor who has been pushed onto us at the insistence of the chairman of the Production and Supply Subcommittee. This was the Labour MP, Lewis Silkin. Drennan added, she is a red-haired lame woman who is a member of the LCC and who has been working in the Ministry of Supply. She rather gives me the horrors. So there you go. Um, Monica Felton obtained her PhD from the LSE um, and was an elected member of the London County Council uh, from 1938 until 1946. Um, after the war, she got involved in new towns and was chairman of first Peter Lee and then the Stevenage New Town Development Corporation. Um, however, in a high-profile event, she was fired from this role by Hugh Dalton, the Minister of Town and Country Planning, after going on an, on an unauthorised trip to North Korea um, for the Women's International Democratic Federation in 1951. Now, that would be controversial today, of course, and it certainly was at the time because the Korean War was uh, going on. Um, she came back and accused American, South Korean and even British troops of involvement in massacres of the Korean population and other atrocities. Um, she, accused, she made these accusations on Radio Moscow and in the Daily Worker. For this, she was accused in Parliament and in the popular press of being a communist and even of treason. Uh, it probably didn't help that she was awarded the Stalin Peace Prize for these efforts. Um, <laughs> And there was a lot of distancing going on. During the parliamentary debates uh, at the time, an MP said, I understand there was a time during the war she was employed um, in a secretarial capacity on the Select Committee on National Expenditure. Uh, she was definitely not employed as a secretarial in a secretarial capacity. She was employed as an economic advisor, as Basil Drennan said, because of her previous experience in the Ministry of Supply and on the London County Council, where she was chairman of the Supply Committee. And I think it's outrageous that she then gets uh, dismissed as secretary all those years later. But then there was a lot of distancing going on. Nobody really wanted to be associated with uh, um, the woman uh, who'd gone to North Korea. Um, the public prosecutor's opinion was there was no evidence for a charge of treason, sedition or anything else. Uh, nevertheless, the episode ruined her career in the UK. Uh, she wrote a book about her experiences uh, in North Korea and then she made a new life for herself in India. Died in 1970. So that's the six stories that I wanted to share with you. Um, I think they certainly echo situations found in workplaces elsewhere during the wars, uh, such as substitution of male labour with female labour, the girl porters, women taking over businesses when their menfolk were called to service, Ashworth and Co. Participation in defence of the realm, the munitions uh, unit and home guard. 
Women taking on new roles beyond that previously defined as women's work. This includes um, several of the women I've talked about, including May Court and, as accountant, Kay Midwinter as Clark in particular. They were often not paid the same rate as men for the same work. Jean Winder, Kay Midwinter and uh, the other female clerks as well. And women were generally, although not always, dismissed at the end of the war. Now, the girl quarters were all dismissed at the end of the war, and a number of the roles associated with wartime also ended at the end of the war. But perhaps Parliament's interesting here, for the exceptions, that actually a number of these women were kept on after the end of the war. Jean Winder stayed on as a Hansard reporter, May Court stayed on and became accountant after the First World War. And I think it's likely that the clerks, uh, the female clerks, Kay Midwinter and uh, Miss Davson, um, if they'd stayed till the end of the war and hadn't got married and so on, I suspect they would have been kept on because they were very highly thought of by their committee office colleagues. I feel that some of these women are real tra trailblazers who deserve wider recognition, and I'm delighted to say that I've been commissioned by the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography to write articles on two of them, May Ashworth um, of Ashworth & Co and Kay Midwinter, the first Commons clerk, and this will help um, these two become better known, I hope. Um, those articles, uh, I've got to submit them by tomorrow, and hopefully they'll be published um, this autumn. But as well as being interesting in their own rights, um, I think these stories illustrate a variety of aspects of women's staff in Parliament, and they help place Parliament in the wider story of the home front in the UK during the two world wars. Thank you very much.